Hello all, it's been a while, and for that I apologize. However, to make up for my recent absence, I come to you with the sole purpose of finally discerning one of Kenshi's greatest mysteries. Today, my friends, we will be taking a deep dive into forgotten history and exploring the depths of his most historically elusive race. So allow me to spin you a tale of a falling empire, crimes that would make the Geneva Convention faint with disgust, and the final attempt for a failing emperor to preserve his order and control over those he thought sought to ruin him, and the father who stands against him to this very day. My friends, I bring to you the dark and twisted origins of the Hivers. Now before I can explain the origins of these seemingly insectoid beings, I must first explain who they are today and the various cultural differences that they represent. All of the things I will explain in this part are backed by in-game materials and translated into my own theories on the origins of these stick-like creatures. Whether you choose to believe me is entirely up to you. However, be warned, my friend. Once you learn the secret of the Hive, you will never be able to return to the innocent mind you once held. So, first things first, we need to know, what are the Hivers? A tedious task, I know, but I urge you to listen as these details will be necessary later on to understand the foul process that led to these creatures' inceptions. The Hivers are an insect-like race that appeared on the planet of Kenshi towards the end of the Second Empire. The exact origins have seemingly been lost to time until now. Despite the clear variation in factions among the Hivers, they all share one thing in common, a caste system of hierarchy with physical variations to each caste. You see, the Hivers still connected to the Hive do not have freedom of choice in their roles. Instead, they are born with a singular purpose, and at the bottom, we have the Worker Drones. Small, meager creatures that lack in physical abilities or intelligence, most famously being our lovable compatriot Beep. More often than not, they're used as disposable infantry, laborers, and farmers. Next comes the soldier drones. These stockier, more muscular creatures have decreased intelligence but make up for it with an aggressive and combative nature making them perfect for protecting the hive without fear or mercy. Following them we have the princes. Blessed with both intelligence and might, though not as much as the soldiers, these beings act as the voices for the hive's queen, leading and organizing their ranks as well as acting as emissaries and merchants to the outside world in the case of the Western Hive. They are widely thought of as the most important of the Queen's children to those who do not know the next type of Hiver, the Praetorians. While the princes handle the masses and the daily affairs, the Praetorians are exclusively born to protect the Hive Queen as royal guard, almost never being seen outside close proximity to the Queen's location. And then we have the queen herself. Well, technically, the Hivers have no gender or genitalia, thus unable to reproduce by conventional means. The queen is equipped with an incubator, seemingly built into her body that allows her, through means I will divulge later in this horrifying tale, to seemingly create a legion of Hivers that bend to her will and control her people through a pheromone link that creates a collective hive mind, bending them to her desires. Those under her spell state that it creates a sense of belonging and collectiveness that gives them purpose. As for those who stray too far from her, they are banished with their connections severed, forcing them to either find an identity of their own, or fall into despair from the strain that the separation causes, till they eventually die. Now that we have gone over the caste system, we must move on to the various factions of Hybers that have inhabited the surface of Kenshi for the last thousand years, the most common being the Western Hive, a faction of peaceful and economic beige-colored Hybers that have successfully integrated into modern society, sending emissaries and merchants across the entirety of the continent to trade their wares. They are skilled farmers and can be seen in their capital location isolated from other forms of life likely sustaining themselves on food they have grown, a fact that will become very important later on in explaining why they are the only peaceful variant of Hiber. The faction itself is significantly larger and has more outposts and villages than those of the Southern and Fogman tribes, for reasons that will soon be brought to light. Next we have the Southern Hive. 
Being in close proximity to the ruins of the Second Empire, these purple-skinned creatures are incredibly organized and hostile, so much so that their territory has remained largely untouched by a thousand years of war and desolation. They stick closely to their homelands and have no settlements outside the Queen's immediate domain. However, the most apparent and interesting thing about these aggressive, warmongering entities is their devotion to a second leader, aptly named King. King is a gargantuan Second Empire crimper that has miraculously learned to coexist in a strange and, as you will learn, grotesque form of symbiotic relationship with the Queen and is worshipped fanatically by the hivers of the Southern Hive. Any who dare to enter the region will quickly be attacked and put down by the Queen's soldiers who roam the area. Those who survive will be brought back to the Capitol building and tied to posts, where they will await a gruesome end at the hands of their king. You will be forced to endure as you and your comrades are crushed and devoured by the Crimper, and the Southern Hivers fanatically bow and chant to their king to deliver them blood. And lastly, we have the Scourge of the Fog, the blue monsters who haunt the nightmares of the inhabitants of Mongrel. No doubt, be wary to lock your doors at night should the Fogmen come and snatch you away. Your screams will be heard for hours, if not days, as they mercilessly tear you piece by piece, bit by bit, until every scrap of you has been consumed by their princes, much to the enjoyment of their mindless drones. The Fogmen are a degraded race of cannibals who roam the mysterious Fog Isles. Having seemingly lost their minds, they travel in hordes, hunting out any scraps of flesh they can find. They will mercilessly pummel travelers with an endless horde of disposable drones until they have rendered their prey unconscious and unable to fight. From there, they will carry them to ritual sites and tie them to await their horrifying end. The princes of this fallen hive who roam the fogs are accompanied by an entourage of soldier drones and are by nature attracted to the weeps and smells of freshly tied victims. Once they've caught a whiff, they will emerge from the fog and begin to ritualistically devour their prey as the hordes of workers and soldier drones screech in pleasure at the horrific act of cannibalism. The screams and pleas of their victims are drowned out by the crunching and gurgling of the princes biting down on their flesh. A fate worse than death, if you ask me. And finally, one last piece of information before we begin our tale. The Hivers have an ability to regurgitate ingested organic material and use that as the foundation for their building materials when building homes and structures. No doubt useful when rebuilding empires and, as you will soon learn, creating more Hivers. So now, my friends, we've reached the point of the story where we can begin to put together the mystery that is the Hivers' existence. You see, the Hivers' entire culture can be summarized by two things reproduction, and regurgitation. But don't worry, I'm not going to show you some X-rated hyperaction, no. But the truth is almost as horrifying as that sight might be. Suddenly, they appeared at the end of the Second Empire with no real explanation. I'd wager that this is because those who know of their origin have long since died or fallen mad by their own guilt. During the final days of the Second Empire, Catlon was plagued by cannibals to the north, rebellions to the south, and famine across his land. He had repeatedly attempted to play God and manipulate his people into his ideals. One such attempt was the creation of the Enforcers, stronger, sturdier, and more aggressive humans who were used to replenish his fallen numbers as well as infiltrate the cult of Stobe that had begun to fester inside the cities of his empire. These enforcers we would now know later to evolve into the Shek. When the famine hit, he realized that he could no longer feed, protect, or control his people. He turned to the same man who had created the enforcers for him, a man with good intentions of saving the populace of this world. This individual would go on to experiment on his people and genetically manipulate them to require less food and be easily controlled to prevent further rebellions and could quickly repopulate his lost numbers with staggering efficiency. A workforce that could rebuild the tattered remains of Catlon's empire. This man would eventually become known as the Bugmaster. 
Eventually, his experiments would yield results in the form of three queens, grown and built to create offspring, offspring that are loyal to them and unquestioning. But the failures of this creation process are what we now call skin spiders, mutated abominations that the enforcers were then tasked with culling to make room for more experiments. This would explain the Shek's cultural need to hunt the Bugmaster and the Skin Spiders. What was once merely a job for the Enforcers, over the centuries progressed into a culture, as well as explaining the striking resemblance that the Spiders have to the Hivers. They are essentially as closely related to them as we are to primates. However, for unknown reasons, the Bugmaster developed a seething hatred for Catlon and began creating more spiders to raise an army against his former master, and genetically modifying himself to halt the aging process. One explanation for the sudden change in the Bugmaster could be the war crimes Catlon committed near the end of the Empire, thralling his subjects or going to war with the Cult of Stope. Another possibility is that the Bugmaster's intention was to use crops as the source of organic material, where Catlon may have had other, more heinous methods in mind that would both cripple his enemies and feed his ranks. But the truth of why is honestly irrelevant here. What matters is that the queens were scattered throughout the continent for an unknown reason. The Queen of the Western Hive found herself on an island isolated off the western coast. With little organic material to work with, her children began farming, using the crops as the necessary bioorganic material to fuel the incubation process. The queen uses the organic matter as a block, and then her genetic template is the base to create the offspring. These creatures serve her faithfully and perform the duties that she needs to run her empire. As a result of finding a sustainable and expandable method of reproduction, they peacefully cohabitate with the rest of the world, engaging in trade, commerce, and developing technology, as well as their use of organic crops being the reasoning for their yellowish beige color as well. Through unknown means, whether Catlon's intervention or a sheer accident, the Hivers of the Southern Tribe came into possession of a crimper bot, capable of crushing down organic life, specifically blood, as indicated by the Hivers screeching and praising while he devours your compatriots. It is implied through in-game dialogue and context clues that this is the source of the Southern Hive's reproduction process. The organic material is crushed down and turned into an acceptable biomass for the queen to use in the reproductive process. This choice to utilize living, sentient beings is lended credence as to why the Southern Hive is a purely aggressive and hostile race, while still maintaining some semblance of both sanity and agriculture in their territories, albeit less than can be found with the Western Hive, since it is purely a food source for them and not needed in the life creation process. The use of blood as their genetic block could be the cause of their purplish skin color. These aggressive and sentient beings are what could be considered the middle ground between the Western Hive's peaceful method of reproduction and the next group's more horrifying methodology. Lastly, we have the Fogmen. It is implied that a parasite took hold of them and drove them mad, or perhaps what I believe is more likely a reality is that the queen died through some unknown means, a parasite being a possibility. The sudden loss of their queen caused hysteria and panic as her subjects fell into despair and their numbers dwindled. The princes discovered a means to continue reproducing and to keep their people alive, likely through using the queen's incubation unit, or even worse, her corpse. But it came with a terrible cost. Without the queen's genetic template, the offspring were created mad, crazed psychopaths with murderous tendencies and no queen's pheromones to keep them in check. It is likely that all of the hivers are first born with these pheromones present, and their nature is dictated by the queen's ambitions. Without the queen present, they would be born into this world with no mind, no personality, and nothing to stop them from acting upon their primal, animalistic urges. I want to believe that the original princes of the Fogman's Hive survived the ordeal. 
but I think it is more likely that they themselves were devoured by their own creations. Those who came next would create a legion of horribly genetically damaged creatures who ritualistically devour and regurgitate genetic material for the purpose of creating more of their corrupted kind. Falling deeper and deeper into their madness with every generation until all that remained was a horde of mass-produced genetic failures who live with a sole, single-minded purpose of creating more of their kind. Sadly, it seems unlikely they will ever be able to revert to their old ways. This is backed up by the lack of buildings, farms, and a seemingly endless number of fogmen. They are able to sustain their numbers through kidnapping, devouring, and expelling the material that was once the travelers and citizens of Mongrel and the Fog Isles to bolster their ranks. As seen through in-game events, the sheer numbers that they command are too much, even for the likes of the Holy Nation, a nation that arguably holds the strongest military force in the game, can be seen losing territory to the Fogman hordes. Perhaps in the not-so-distant future, all races will become fuel for the Fogman's rampage across Kenji. And that, my dear viewers, is my take on the origins and the explanations for Kenji's most mysterious race. Do you agree with me? Was there something that I missed along the way to reaching this dark and horrifying conclusion? If so, please let me know in the comment section down below. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe as it keeps my channel relevant so that I can keep bringing you new content like this. This has been Hero on His Head, and I will be seeing you all in the next video real soon.